All right. Welcome, everybody, to Pro 213. Uh, it will be a short mod, as they all are, just four weeks, and we're going to be talking about personal financial management. Of course, this is one of the pro classes, and so you don't have tests, you don't have assignments, but you do have a weekly discussion board. We'll get into that here in just a minute. It's a little bit different format if you've had the regular courses before this. Uh, but I assume that most of you have had a course before. If you haven't, uh, be in touch with me if you've got any questions on how to navigate the site, on how to complete your coursework, on how to turn things in, anything that might come up that you're concerned about. My name is David Shipley. I'll be the facilitator for this course and the instructor. As I mentioned on the website, uh, we'll be having these live sessions on Mondays at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And of course, this is the Monday of the first week. Uh, where you just barely, you know, uploaded the class, you know, just barely had access to the class at the earliest today. So I didn't expect a lot of attendance, but I'd love to have a few of you join uh, for future weeks if you can. It's not required to join in in the live sessions, but it is required to review the sessions. And so at a minimum, I do expect that you'll be listening to these sessions. And uh, I'm, I'm convinced that those folks who put in the effort in order to review the sessions uh, are able to be a little bit more successful in the course because I'm able to give direction on how I expect the assignments to be completed. In this, in this particular case for this course, it's the discussion boards, right? Uh, and because there are only discussion boards in this class, you'll note that the discussion boards, there's just more, uh, more of your grade, obviously, about a quarter of your grade every single week has to do with your discussion board. And so make sure you put in sufficient effort that you get it in and, and meet expectations and that you follow instructions very carefully. This week, uh, the discussion board, as will many of the weeks, has a lot of uh, instructions associated with a lot of parts to the instructions. And so just be careful that you read through it, read through it carefully and follow all the parts, okay? So tonight we're gonna be talking about budgets, but to back up a little bit, we're gonna be talking about personal finance in this class. And personal finance is one of those uh, topics that a lot of people don't get too excited about. Uh, they don't want to talk about their money. In fact, uh, the generations, you know, the baby boomers didn't even want to talk about it, you know. So not only did they not want to think about it or plan like most of us, they also just didn't want to talk about it. They felt like it was a very private issue. And so many times I'll be working with clients as a financial advisor and they'll be talking about how their parents never talked about money or they'll talk about how their parents passed away and they received a significant inheritance and they had no idea their parents even had any money or their grandparents even had any money. And so, because they just never talked about it and they lived frugally. So it's a little different now. I think for Generation X, Y, and the millennials, I think most of them are a little bit more open about money. Uh, that doesn't mean they're better with their money. <laughs> In fact, if anything, the opposite is true. A lot of times X, Y, and, and millennials will... Uh, be less responsible, uh, maybe use more tools to help manage their money, but in the end are less disciplined about living below their means. Because when it comes down to it, and we'll talk about this tonight as far as budgeting is concerned, you can budget all you want, but in the end it comes down to you exercising discipline and, and either following a budget or it, at a minimum at least just having a sense for the fact that you're spending less than you're making right? And, that, and that's pretty easy principle, right? Spend less than you make. Uh, easy principle, a little bit less easy to actually follow, especially when you're trying to go to school and you're trying to balance, you know, your work life with your family life with all kinds of different things that you might have. And so uh, I understand it's a challenge. It's easier said than done. And so the point of tonight is to give you a lot of ticks, tricks and tips, um, you know, to try to give you the best uh, ideas as far as budgeting is concerned that, that are out there so that if you do use a budget, which I hope you will, uh, or at least refer to a budget periodically, that you'll have some tools uh, to be able to use and be able to utilize to, to be successful in your budgeting. All right, let's back up and talk a little bit about course expectations, uh, talk a little bit about what's due this week, and then we'll get into some of the readings. Now, as far as the course is concerned, it is mostly web links to uh, video content, to podcasts, to web pages, and written content. Most of it's written content, but it mixes in some videos and, and podcasts as well. Uh, this week, there's a podcast as well as some written content, some different sites 
that I think are great resources when it comes to budgeting. So not only is it required to at least review the session each week, but it's also at a base minimum, the requirement is whether or not you use all the material or not for the discussion board, that you'll have read and reviewed and listened to all the material that was assigned for the week. And hopefully, uh, you know, the idea is that you'll be able to demonstrate through the discussion board that you did look at the required minimum material and did review the session. So for full credit, that's the minimum expectation that you would demonstrate that you had reviewed all the required material and of course part of that required material is the session. Uh, one of the topics that comes up in every single course that I instruct and I've been teaching for seven years, so this is every single mod for the last seven years, over a hundred different mods, is do you accept late work? The answer is yes, you have up until Saturday at midnight. The at the end of the, the close of the mod, so four weeks from now, you have up until Saturday at midnight to turn everything in. I will grade everything, and I will give at least partial credit for everything. I will give whole credit, you know, 100% credit to anything that's turned in on time and where instructions are followed carefully. Uh, where instructions aren't followed or when things aren't turned in on time, I can't give full credit. So, yes, you can turn things in late, but just know that there'll be a discount for late work anywhere from 10, 20, even as much as 30%, depending on how late the assignment is, okay? So that's the question of late work. As far as contacting me, you're welcome uh, to text me or call me. My phone number is listed under the uh, bio information on the main course page. Uh, having said that, I have a day job, and so I encourage people just to email me. Uh, I'll get back to you within 24 hours, and I'd appreciate an email because it allows me to think through what you're asking and, and be able to formulate the best answer possible, where sometimes if you catch me in between things, I don't have as much time to think through the best way to answer. So I'd encourage you to email, but you're welcome to text or call as well, and I'll get right back to you. As far as grades are concerned, uh, I will have everything graded by Tuesday at noon. I think school policy is Wednesday at noon. I just get everything graded by Tuesday at noon. Usually it'll happen after our live session, uh, the grading will. I, I usually wait on grading just as a heads up to everybody so that I can be more equitable as far as how I grade. I find if I grade more uh, assignments at the same time, I'm able to uh, be more, like I say, equitable, fair, uh, from one student to the next. So instead of grading along the way, I usually just grade everything on Monday night or Tuesday morning of each week, and you'll have your grades back as well as some feedback so that you can uh, either improve your score, which is possible. Uh, I'll en encourage you to turn in more work if you haven't fulfilled the entire assignment. For example, when it comes to this class with discussion boards, if you complete two of the three posts, I'll encourage you to add another post for additional credit. If you, for example, this week when we're, the assignment is to complete an Excel spreadsheet budget, if you submit a Word document and it doesn't have the categories that the instructions call for, I might say, here is your score. You're welcome to resubmit an Excel sheet as the instructions call for and fill in more detail for additional credit. Okay, so those are some examples of maybe some feedback that I might give. And usually, if you don't receive full credit other than for being late, I'll give you the opportunity to edit and update and add so that if your effort uh, dictates it, that I can give you extra points, okay? Usually, if you don't receive full credit the first time, you won't be able to receive full credit, but you will be able to add points to your score. And so another common question in a course is, do you offer extra credit? The answer is no. That's a school policy. Um, the, the fact of the matter is you've got lots of extra credit opportunities from the daily checkpoints. The daily checkpoints are worth about a half a letter grade, but then there's another uh, pretty significant, or excuse me, a couple letter grades, but then there's an, another about half a letter grade in extra credit available if you'll complete every day's checkpoint. So it's worth being consistent and staying consistent with the checkpoints because there's quite a bit of extra credit associated with checkpoints if you'll stay diligent with it. Okay, so that's your extra credit opportunity as well as if you turn something in and I give you feedback on what you did wrong and you're willing to resubmit, edit, or add, uh, I will go ahead and add points uh, if I see additional effort and understanding based on uh, what you submitted. Okay. Okay, so every course, and you probably, if you've taken a few courses before this, maybe you're getting sick of hearing 
about plagiarism, but it's something that uh, it's it's an issue. It's it's a challenge. Uh, whenever you teach online courses, obviously there's a there's a significant uh, temptation, especially if you're running behind or don't have a lot of time to go ahead and steal other people's work from online. And you know, some of you might feel like that's just absolutely you know doesn't hurt anybody, doesn't doesn't cause any problems. You know, without going into the full background on why plagiarism is such a big problem and why it has serious consequences. Let me just say that it's a school policy that you don't plagiarize, so don't cut and paste from anywhere online. And it's a school policy that if you have already been warned about plagiarism and then do it again, you'll you'll fail the, the course. And so I don't want to fail anybody in the course. In fact, I'd love it if everybody got, you know, an A in the course. And so I just bring it up because I don't want anybody to go through the situation where we have to visit about it and then we have to take further action if necessary. And the bottom line is if you take information or do research online, just make sure that you're giving credit where credit's due and understand that for the most part, especially in a class where it's mostly discussion boards like these pro classes, we're interested in your feedback, in your ideas, in your perspective and your experiences and your opinions we are not nearly as interested in what you find from somebody else online okay even if it's good um, we will ask for references we'll ask for sources and that's to supplement your opinions perspective experience and your thoughts because that's the primary exercise that we're trying to accomplish on the discussion board is to have you think through the different topics that we're discussing form opinions and and be thoughtful about the type the information that we're covering right the more thoughtful you are about it the more processing you do the more these the information will sink in uh, the more you just go online and find somebody else's information and, and regurgitate it onto the board uh, the less you'll actually get from a course like this so do I want you to do research yes do I want you to go out and find other people's information and ideas yes because that will help you to form your own opinions and to create your own information but uh, if you are researching, just make sure that you give credit where credit's due, okay? That's plenty of information on that. I like to explain more about the why, which is just that we're interested in you going through the exercise of forming your own opinions and coming up with your own thoughts as opposed to just always going and collecting thoughts and opinions from other people online, okay? All right, so that's the why on plagiarism. Please don't have us talk about it. If you've got any questions on it, though, or questions on how to avoid it, uh, don't don't be a, don't be afraid to talk to me about it. Um, just just get in touch with me. Just let me know that this is a new concept to you, and that you'd like to figure out some more ways to make sure that you avoid even you know what looks like it could be plagiarism because you really don't want to go down that road. Okay. All right. Enough about that. We're not going to talk about plagiarism again unless there's a problem, and uh, hopefully it's just a review for all of you. As far as this week is concerned, oh, just one more quick note as far as grades are concerned. Uh, of course, we talked about when the grading comes, but I also want to just point out that, you know, in seven years and 100 plus mods, there's something very consistent that happens in these courses as far as grading is concerned, and that is the folks who put in the effort and turn things in pass classes and get the scores that they're looking for. The folks who run out of time and don't get everything in or have to cram everything right at the very end and don't give themselves enough time to really succeed in the course, sometimes they don't pass the class and sometimes they don't get the grade that they want. And so if you're really interested in getting an A, for example, just stay caught up, manage your time wisely, and turn things in according to the instructions. Put in the effort, right? Follow the instructions carefully. It's really pretty straightforward. Does, there's, it's not more complicated than that. You don't need to be a certain level of smart you don't need a certain IQ. I don't need to determine that you're a really, really smart, intelligent person in order for you to get a grade in this class that you're looking for. Uh, none of that really matters as much as your effort and your attention to the instructions and the details. Okay? So turn things in on time, pay attention to details and instructions, and you'll be fine. You'll get the grade that you want from this class. This is not a difficult class. Now, sometimes when I say that, people, you know, sit back and think, oh, great, you know, this is just going to be easy. I don't have to do anything. That's not what I said. I said this is a simple class. It's straightforward. If you do the work and put in the effort, you'll get the grade you want. It doesn't mean that some of these assignments won't, and I say assignments, but some of these discussion boards won't be fair, you know, there won't be some difficult aspects to them or some challenging things or things that take a little bit more time. 
But as a general rule, relative to other courses, like some of the accounting classes and math cor courses that I've taught, or corporate finance classes that I've taught, this is a relatively easy course, pretty straightforward, pretty simple. So if you get caught on anything or feel like you're stuck on anything, no worries, just reach out to me. Uh, we should have some simple feedback for you that should be able to help you to get, you know, to move on and get the grade you want as we, as we uh, have mentioned. All right, so this week we've got a checkpoints, of course. We'll always have checkpoints. We also have a discussion board. That's it. Uh, the discussion board though, has some different parts. And one of the things that we need to be careful about on the discussion board is, once again, that we're reading through all the required material. In this case, there's a, there's a podcast that I want you to listen to that's, that's on there as far as the required material. And once you've gone through that, then there's a series of about nine or 11 steps, okay, that go point by point on helping you to walk through creating a budget. Okay, we're going to talk a lot about what budgets are, what they look like tonight, but um, this will walk you through, the instructions will walk you through each of the steps uh, as far as making a budget. Now, I realize that some of your budgets are going to be a little more complicated and complex. You've got more issues going on, more income, more expenses. And others of you, you know, maybe, you're, maybe you don't have a job and you live with your parents and you don't pay any expenses. And if that's the case, I'd like you to create a, a scenario, maybe for your parents, not using their exact information, but just kind of coming up with what you think it might look like uh, so that there is a little bit more detail on your budget. So just as a, as a, a, a warning or a caution, if you, don't, if you don't really have a budget or anything to put on a budget because you have no income or expenses, I need you to create something. Um, don't say, hey, you know, don't submit something that says I don't, you know, there's nothing that to, for me to put down. I want you to create a scenario if you don't have a scenario of some different income and some different expenses to put down, okay? And like I say, the, the discussion board assignment just walks you through uh, point by point to be able to, to complete this assignment. Let me quickly go to... There's my email for a second. Okay, so just as an example, this feedthepig.org, which is, you've, you've maybe heard commercials from feedthepig.org, or if you haven't, maybe you'll, you'll uh, notice them now going forward. But the AICPA, which is the Association of CPAs, Certified Pub Public Accountants, has, has this organization or this not-for-profit that basically is, it's, its whole design is to help people be better with their money which makes sense because CPAs are helping us to do our taxes, right, and saving taxes. So this organization, that's a very large association, is there trying to create tools and advertising and sites and all kinds of different uh, feedback for you and I about budgets and about expenses and about trying to be better with our money. So we go to this site. You should be able to see this site at this point. It talks about uh, you know, it, it basically starts with your income and taxes away from that income, and then it splits into different things like your spouse's income, your mortgage or your debt, your rent, uh, goes into all kinds of different kind of subcategories of budgets like utilities, food, insurance. So if you, if, you know, this is just one example of a budget worksheet within this feedthepig.org site, which is one that you've got listed or referred to on the, on the required readings. But I just wanted to point that out because this is one way that you could, you know, get ideas on different budget topic areas. You could also just Google budget templates and you'll find lots and lots of different templates online, uh, some in Excel, some not. Uh, but find one in Excel if you're, if you're having a hard time coming up with categories or, or issues so that you can have those categories in front of you as you're completing this week's discussion board. And then you'll be attaching your Excel sheet, your budget, to the discussion board so that we can see it and review it. And uh, like I say, there's a lot of specific detail on the instructions, so I'll refer you to that to make sure that you uh, know what you're doing this week on the on the board, okay? All right, so we're gonna be creating a budget this week in Excel. Now, your grade is not gonna depend on how pretty your Excel sheet looks. Uh, I am probably 
uh, you know, it would be hypocritical of me to expect a lot of your Excel sheets because I am not very, I'm not great in Excel. I can get around it pretty well. I can crunch numbers pretty well in Excel. I can do some tables and charts, but I, I'm, I'm not very good at making it look pretty and formatting uh, Excel sheets. So if you have just a very simple, straightforward budget with uh, maybe income on one side and expenses on the other or, or you know, and, and basically do some totaling, you know, some sum uh, calculations of, of both your income and your, and your uh, expenses in order to know basically where you're at with total income and total expenses, then you'll be in great shape. Just follow the point by point you know, that it gives and don't stress too much about making the Excel sheet look great unless that's something that you have a talent or a skill for. Uh, but just make sure that the content that it's asking for is present. And like I say, if it takes you coming up with kind of a, a made up scenario so that you have more expense categories and more income categories, that's fine. I'd rather have that than, as I mentioned before, someone who says, all I pay for every month is going out to fast food, and that's like 100 bucks. Everything else I, is covered. I don't pay for anything. So that's not a very helpful exercise when it comes to budgeting. Uh, at some point, all of our budgets, income, and expenses, even if they're simple now, will become more complex, right? So for some of you who are uh, a, a few more years down the road and a little bit more experience and more things in life to complicate and, and create expense and income have come, you know, have come. Uh, you can attest to the fact that, you know, these budgets become more and more complex and complicated as life goes on and, and our lives become more complex. Okay. All right. So let's, oh, one of the, one of the things uh, that I just wanted to point out, and I think it's safe to point out at this point, is that apps, mobile apps especially, have made budgeting uh, much more simple. And I, I alluded to this earlier when I talked about how our generation, and I say our, but if you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, our generations are more uh, able to use apps, right, and tools that are out there online for budgeting. Doesn't mean that we actually follow them better than our parents and grandparents, but it does mean that we are a little bit more uh, well, we're just more prone to be able to use, you know, mobile apps and online tools in order to help us with our budgeting and finances. And there are lots of tools out there, some better than others, but, you know, there's no, there's no excuse for not creating a budget because even if you find that Excel is kind of clunky and you can't make it look right or work right, there are all kinds of free mobile apps uh, free online resources that allow you to just plug some numbers in and they start to track for you or with you your spending and your monthly you know income and expenses and so uh, no real excuse now at this point even if you you know even if the manual exercise of doing it in Excel kind of you know it's too much for you it'd be too bothersome uh, there are all these tools that make it very easy and so I gave you this link uh, now this is just one link there are lots and lots of other you know things that you could do, but uh, this just basically goes through slides of different mobile apps and online tools that you could use for budgeting. And some are pay for apps, just as a heads up, but it does tell you if they are, but there are plenty of non pay for apps, free apps that you can use for budgeting that I think are great tools and give you a great start, something right in the palm of your hand to help remind you and stay focused on you know, what that budget is and, and, and also what it means. And, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but all of the tips and tricks that you'll find, uh, all these articles, the podcast, there is a consistent few tips and tricks across all of them. One of the tips or tricks that's consistent across all of them is if you don't have a purpose or an overarching goal, a goal that's bigger than the budget itself, that you're working towards and a reason for your budget, it becomes very, very difficult, very difficult to stay consistent with a budget or stay disciplined with a budget. Let me just give you an example that's not related to money. If I want, if I wanted to lose 10 pounds, okay, and it's just a nice idea, it's just the New Year's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to lose 10 pounds. If you were to guess uh, the, the amount of people who are successful in 
you know, year at New Year's goals, right, with weight loss, we'd probably guess that it's pretty low. And and not to discourage anybody, but, um, you know, it's probably a pretty low percentage of folks who actually follow through with all their New Year's goals. Now, you're going to have some people who are very disciplined and they do it. Just like you have some people who are very disciplined and they, they, they have a budget just because they know they're supposed to. There's no other goal. There's no other overarching thing. It's just, it's just something they're supposed to do. So they do it. They're disciplined. They like doing it. They like crunching numbers. Some of them are accountants. That's just what they like to do. And so they have a spreadsheet and they keep track of all their expenses. But most of us, again, most of us are not that way. We're not going to just do a budget because we enjoy the numbers. Most of us don't enjoy the numbers. We think it's tedious and we're not going to be having fun doing budgeting each and every day of our lives financially. Okay. So what's the answer? Well, in the case of losing weight, uh, the efficacy of somebody or the, the success rate of somebody who's gone to a doctor and the doctor has said, if you don't lose 10 pounds, you will die uh, because you're overweight and it will kill you. Um, you know, and this is an extreme example, but I bet if we, again, did some research, I bet we'd find that the folks who hear that from their doctor are, tend to be more driven and tend to be more uh, successful when it comes to trying to lose weight, other than just somebody who says, I just want to do it, you know, for the heck of it. Uh, so, so that's just a, that's an off example, uh, you know, it's analogous to, to losing weight, right, when it comes to budgeting. It's a difficult thing to do. Most of us don't do it. Most of us think it's tedious. Most of us aren't very successful with our goals related to our finances. But if we have something occur that kind of refocuses us and keeps us accountable, many times we will actually stay on track for a budget. Let me give you an example on the finances side. If we had a very firm goal for an early retirement date, or if we had a firm goal for paying off our home, our house entirely, or if we had a firm goal for paying off a car or saving up for the next car or saving up for the next house or to get into a house from a rental, these are the kind of goals, depending on the person, that can drive results, right? So if I have been eyeing a Tesla my whole life, and I really, really want a Tesla, but Teslas are $100,000 other than the new Tesla 3, right? That starts at 35000 But let's say I want the full Model S, right? I want the nice version of the car, the one that's really, really fast, okay? So I'm going to get some upgrades. I need about $100,000 to do that. That's a lot of money, right? Even, even for somebody who's fairly wealthy, $100,000 is no slouch. That's a lot of money. Well, if I'm obsessed with it and I really want it, I can make that happen. Uh, I might have to finance it, right? I might have to save up for a down and then finance it. Or I might just be extremely disciplined, save every dime I possibly can, live very frugally, and get to a point where I can have the car that I, that I have really set out and had a goal to have. Now, for some of you, you're saying, yeah, that's fine for you to say, but I'm in a financial situation. There's no way I could do that. If you feel like that, I would encourage you to listen to Dave Ramsey a couple times. Just, you know, even if he really bugs you, just listen to his show a few times. What you'll find is you have people that on normal or what we'd call regular incomes with life's challenges, still, if they get laser focused on paying off their homes or their debt, right, credit card debt, car debt, they can have 50, 60, 100, $150,000 worth of debt within a few short years of really extreme focus and effort and discipline. They pay it off. And there's story after story. I mean, every single show that he does, Dave Ramsey will have people on the line that will talk about their success in paying off a significant amount of debt. And so the flip side is true. You can get laser focused about debt or you can get laser focused about college education for your kids or laser focused about retiring early or laser focused about the next car or paying off your home. There's all kinds of goals, bigger goals, right? And it could be a mixture of all those goals, right? Okay, so maybe we're trying to accomplish multiple things, which most of us are, right? We want to retire. We want the next car. We want the vacation. We want the second home. We want a rental property. There's all kinds of different good financial goals out there. And we, when we write them down and make a plan, okay, when we write them down and make a plan, at the granular level or at the basic level, uh, at the most basic level of our finances, it comes down to are we going to be disciplined about a budget? in order to get to that goal. 
Okay. Another thing that's consistent about budgeting that, that is, is good to point out at this point. Okay. So we talked about how we need an overarching goal. We need a bigger goal that we're trying to accomplish, a motivator, something that drives us through some of the tedious work that has to be done and the discipline that has to be shown in order to accomplish our budget and make sure and budget for the things that are important. So that's, step, that's kind of the consistent theme one. Consistent theme two is that uh, income is not the primary determiner of whether or not you're going to be successful with a budget or not. So many, many people will say, okay, will say, I am a teacher. I don't make much income. So budgeting is silly. I, sh I don't need to budget. I, I'm never going to have enough money to save a lot. Um, so it's a, it's a lost cause. I'm a lost cause. I don't make enough money to, to save a lot. And of course, income matters. We need to have some income. We need to be able to cover base expenses. We need to be able to, you know, to survive, right? We need a roof over our heads. We need food. We need to be able to pay for insurances and things like that at a base level, but it's a very base level. The point that I'm trying to make is that it does not matter how much we make uh, how much we make does not determine whether or not we're going to be successful financially or whether or not we're going to be, and perhaps more importantly for this course, whether or not we're going to be successful with our budget, okay? Some of the wealthiest people, talking about when we get to retirement, some of the wealthiest people and people that have the most freedom, meaning no debt, ability to travel, ability to buy things for their children and grandchildren, ability to buy things for themselves as they plan it, the folks who sometimes are the most successful in getting to that point, that they are the wealthiest or most affluent or most free or liberated as far as their finances are concerned when they reach retirement, are folks who had to be very careful throughout their lives. What do I mean by that? Well, we've got a doctor who makes a half a million dollars a year and he doesn't have to be very careful or she doesn't have to be very careful about her finances and budgeting to be able to make ends, you know, to be able to make and pay for everything that she wants to or he wants to each month. But a school teacher who makes $25,000 a year and is trying to support a family and trying to save and invest for the future as well has to be very careful and very disciplined and very frugal. And many times because they have to do that, they train themselves over time and they create habits over time that create a lot of success. So it kind of goes back to the hare versus the, the tortoise, right? The tortoise and the hare racing each other. And the hare takes a break. The hare's not very focus the tortoise is very focused but slow but yet the tortoise wins right so in finances that oftentimes is the case where somebody stays very focused on their financial goals and what they're trying to accomplish long term and somebody else isn't very focused makes a lot of money but has nothing to show for it and in the end the person that was very consistent and focused of course ends up you know, being able to do what they want in retirement where the person who wasn't focused, no matter how much money they made, uh, you know, isn't able to do what they want. You'd be surprised how many people can make two hundred, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars a year and have nothing to show for it a few years later. And then you'd be surprised how many people retire after making, you know, an average income, maybe thirty or forty or fifty thousand dollars over their lifetimes on average, and have significant savings and have no debt. So it's not as much about how much you make as it is about how disciplined you are to a plan and living below your means. Uh, Dave Ramsey has, makes the comment a lot. I don't think he penned it. I don't think it's his thought, but he often will say, live like others won't, so you, live like, you can live like others can't. Okay? Live like others won't, so live like other people won't, won't choose to, so that in the future you can live like others can't. Um, debt is the primary driver of why people get to retirement and can't live how they want to live. Okay, you can be making a half a million dollars a year and then you retire and you've made that over your whole entire career and if you haven't paid off your debt and if you don't have significant savings, there's no way you're going to be able to maintain your lifestyle into retirement. Yet somebody who makes a modest income and has saved very diligently, maybe saved 15 to 20 percent of their overall income over their lifetimes and that's both in 401ks and IRAs and savings programs and just been consistent with that, they'll be able to replace their full income and have no debt by the time they get to retirement if they're focused, right? And if they're disciplined. And budgets can be a big part of that. But again, they're, back to theme one, there's got to be an overarching goal that we're trying to get to because most of us aren't disciplined without a goal that's, that's, that's pretty intense and motivating. Without that goal that's intense and motivating, we're not going to do it. 
And secondly, so we've got that overarching goal. Secondly, you know, we're not focused on how much income it is that we make. We're focused on how disciplined we are in living below our means and saving and investing and paying down debt uh, to get to that future point that we're trying to get to. And thirdly, and this is just an overarching theme that I think is critically important to budgeting and finances, is to automate as much as possible. So there's a book by David Bach called Automatic Millionaire. And basically the point of his book is the more automated you make your finances, the more successful that you will be. And he cites a couple different statistics, one of which is that most people statistically only have their 401k for retirement when they arrive at retirement, meaning the only thing that they save for the future was their 401k. And why was that the only thing that is there when they retire? It's because it's the only thing for many people that was automated, that was automatic, that was easy. They didn't have to think about it. If you and I get to the end of the month, and every month we say, okay, if there's money left over in our account at the end of the month, we're going to save for the future and we're going to invest and we're going to pay down debt. If we say that to ourselves, 99% of the time we are not going to have any money left and we are not going to be able to ever make progress towards our goals. But instead, and this goes back to that whole concept of pay yourself first. Instead, if we automate our savings, if we automate, automate our debt pay down, and then actually use what's left instead of trying to use what's left and keep some left over for saving and investing, even subconsciously we'll be more successful because for some reason, no matter how much money we make, if we put that money in our checking account for most of us, and it's not everybody, but for most of us, that money will get spent. Okay, Something will come up, that money will get spent. But for most of us, the same amount of money will go further if we will automate our saving and investing and debt pay down strategies. If we'll automate all that, make it so we don't have to think about it, it happens without us, uh, we'll be a lot more successful because we'll be more consistent, right? All right, so just a couple overarching themes that I wanted to talk about before we get to some of these tips and tricks. And you'll see in the tips and tricks on some of the articles that are on the different sites that you get linked to, you'll see some of the same information that I've talked about. But I wanted to get those three big ones out of the way. You need an overarching goal. Don't be focused on the income. And automate, automate, automate. Okay? All right. So what I did is I, I took some of the high points from some of these articles, what I felt like were high points, and I just wanted to point them out. Obviously, we we'll want you to review these, but I wanted to give you some basic feedback on a few of the points that I thought were really interesting or important. So there's an article this week, one of the sites that is basically a 10 tricks to a successful budgeting. And I, I think some of the good things that it talks about are that you start clean, right? That you don't worry about what your past is with your finances. Obviously, those will have a consequence or can have a consequence on what you need to do. But just start with a clean slate, okay? Populate one item at a time as far as your expenses and one item at a time as far as your income. Just that exercise alone sometimes will help us to get focused or refocused on being more disciplined about our finances. Um, so start clean. Use different helps. We talked about how there's lots of different helps out there, lots of different tools and tricks, uh, especially mobile apps I think are excellent to help us. Um, you know, there's, there's things like Fitness Pal for fitness, right? And, and, and you can count calories now with mobile apps. You can count steps, obviously, with different devices. Budgeting's no different. There's a lot of different uh, helps out there and software out there that's very, very good, that's free, that's just very helpful when it comes to trying to, uh, you know, making sure that we stay consistent with a budget and stay consistent with a plan. Make sure when you're doing a budget that you prioritize your debt. Uh, this is one of those things that you can become better at over time. One of the things that Dave Ramsey is very good at, and his literature is very good at through financial peace, is making sure that you have kind of this snowball effect where you pay off the smallest debt item first, and then you take that same payment that you were making on the smallest debt payment and roll it into the next debt payment. And you prioritize by how large the different debts are. Okay, so the last one that you paid off is probably your home, right? and you'd pay off credit cards in order by how large the balances are. It just makes it a little bit easier. It, it doesn't, it's not always foolproof. The, the best plan that you can have is one that mixes the roll-up strategy based on the size of your debt with a roll-up strategy based on the size of the interest cost. 
Okay. So what you'd be doing is you'd be looking through your debt and prioritizing excess payments to those debts or that debt, excuse me, with the lowest balance plus the highest interest. And you'd use both those uh, metrics to, to prioritize which debt you should pay off first. Now, it's very common for me to meet with somebody who's paying excess, not a lot, but some excess payment towards multiple areas of debt, right? So they'll be making a little bit extra payment on their home and a little bit extra payment on their car, and they'll pay a little bit extra on a student loan, and they'll pay a little bit extra on their car loan. And when we crunch the numbers with that little bit extra, even though it's making good progress and they're, and they're doing something that's very good, and I try to be very, very complimentary of anybody who is making excess payments, I can show them that if they would just focus all those excess payments onto their smallest debt, and then once that smallest debt is paid off, roll it to the next debt, that full payment plus the excess, then they will pay off their debt a lot faster. And so even though excess payments, small excess payments on everything is, is, is great, it's to be commended, I'm glad you're making excess payments, know that prioritizing the debt that you should pay off first based on the size and the interest rate will get you to your goal of paying off debt a lot faster. Okay, you just, it, it comes down to discipline though, once you've paid off that debt to make sure that full payment, right, that you were already expending anyway, goes to the next debt that you're servicing instead of keeping some of that money back for your own use, okay? Again, take some discipline to do that. Uh, so budgeting needs to be, you know, one of the success principles that it talks about is making it more than tracking, okay? If it's just a tedious tracking thing, as we've talked about before with, with that first theme that I said is really important about budgeting, it's got to be a bigger deal. It's got to be a, there's got to be something motivating about it. It can't just be about money. It's got to be about lifestyle in the future. It's got to be about helping somebody. It's got to be about something that you can accomplish with your life or with others that's important to you. And if you can get to that point, then the budgeting, even though it can be tedious and even though it can take some time and even though it does take some discipline, you, you'll do it, right, for that bigger goal. Uh, make sure that you've got some wiggle room in a budget. A lot of times the first mistake, the first biggest mistake that people make with a budget is they try to account for every single penny. What ends up happening is that they've got all their pennies all, all allocated out and then something one-off happens like a car breaks down or they need new tires or they need to go out, you know, get a gift for a, a present for somebody. You know, all very important things that sometimes feel like they're necessary, health issues. We need to build in always a little bit of wiggle room within our within our budget so that and and this is an important concept because what ends up happening is if you don't put any wiggle room in, life will definitely happen to you and there'll be a time where you need some extra cash and you might have to go rob an area that is not good to rob or take a payday loan or get a title loan or put on some credit card debt at a bad interest rate. All these things happen because we don't have a little bit of flexibility within our budget and we don't have sometimes that emergency reserve that's step one. You know, as far as using discretionary money, we want to establish some, you know, some kind of emergency reserve account. Then we want to pay down debt. Then we want to, you know, add to the future accounts, you know, and, and save and invest as much as we can. So there's kind of an order of priority to it. It's not that we can't accomplish all three of those things at the, at the same time, right? We can contribute to a 401k and get a free match. We can pay a little bit extra on some of our worst debt that's at the highest interest rate. But thirdly, and more importantly than those other two, especially if we don't have an emergency reserve, we're going we're gonna to start putting some money away for emergency reserve, okay? Uh, it's important that you are able to go back and adjust your budget. Don't make it some, you know, ironclad document that you frame on the wall. Uh, that, that's not going to help you. Uh, make it something that you can adjust as life changes. Life will change. You've got to be able to change your budget with it. And then finally, and this goes without saying, but it's just the most important part, is that we, have, we, we exercise some discipline when it comes to our budget. Uh, if we can exercise some discipline, we'll be successful. If we, if we have a hard time being disciplined about it, again, go back to that theme one, right? Find a motivating, something motivating, something that you feel very, that is very, very important about your finances. Either it gives you, it buys you more time, it buys you more liberty, it buys you, you know, the opportunity at some point to be free from having to work nine to five or eight to five or seven to five or 10 to 10 every day, you know, whatever your hours are. 
at some point your finances and being disciplined about your finances can get you to a point where not that you have to step away from work, but that you have the ability to. That's a very liberating thing. Uh, that you get out from under different debts. Uh, that you're able to help other people. That you're able to give charitably. Uh, there's all That you're able to help your kids more and help them with school. There's all kinds of different good goals that can be more motivating to one person versus another, right? Uh, one person might be mo motivated by one of the things I just mentioned, and somebody else might be rolling their eyes like, why would I be motivated by that? Find something that you can be motivated by so that it makes your budget doable and so that it helps you to stay motivated, focused, and more disciplined. So then there's an, a different article about um, steps uh, as far as budgets are concerned, steps to successful budgets. On the eight steps one, I think I listed every single one of them, but but these are things that we've already talked about a little bit, but just make sure it's simple. Don't make it too complicated. I mentioned before that some of our budgets will get more complex as we get a little bit more down the road, you know, with maybe family and, and other things, but that doesn't mean because it has more categories that it's not still a very simple thing, okay? Once you've established some of your fixed costs each month and established ranges for your non-fixed costs, your variable costs, it shouldn't take very long periodically to go in and just update something or adjust something, right? Uh, you don't have to start over every single time, uh, you know, and so this should be something that's pretty straightforward and simple. If it means using, you know, once again, a mobile app or an online tool, do it. Uh, make this as simple as possible so that it's not something that you, you know, just hate and labor through every time. If you, if you, don't, if you hate it, enough, you just won't ever do it, right? So we want it to be something that's simple um, and, and not too hard, but yet satisfying, fulfilling, you know, motivating, those kinds of things. Uh, put a little bit of time into it. Obviously, it requires some time. We used to talk in the financial planning world that people on average, you know, there's just a statistic out there that says that people on average spend more time planning their vacations each year than they do on their financial planning or financial futures as far as their planning is concerned. And I, you know, I can see it in my own life sometimes. I get excited about vacations, motivated by vacations, and I start to plan and I start thinking about it a lot. I don't think about it a lot when it comes to my budgets. I, I you know, I don't want to spend as much time on them. And so um, I need to get it established. I need to follow up with it. I need to be disciplined and focused about it. But I don't have to spend a lot of time. I just have to spend more consistent time. It's kind of like the checkpoints in a class like this. You don't have to spend a lot of time on checkpoints, right? But you got to be disciplined about coming in every day or it's not going to, it's not going to do as much good as it could, right? Uh, make sure you've got an emergency reserve. One of the key steps, again, this is a theme that, you'll, that you've been hearing now, you know, as we've been talking about an emergency fund, you've got to have some cash sitting somewhere that can help you because the first thing that blows up your budget, you know, the first time that your budget gets blown up, uh, you know, you're going to give up on your budget if it, if it gets screwed up by some kind of emergency that come, takes place if you haven't prepared for that. And so just like a, a, a you know, diet, if, uh, if you go off the reservation and, you know, because of a birthday party or a, a holiday and you, you eat, you know, way more than you were supposed to and go way overboard on the calories, you got to have a contingency for that, right? Um, you know, you got to allow for some flexibility. You've got to allow for, a, you know, a contingency on an event like that. Or what happens is if you're trying to be too strict, and something like that happens, or in this case, an emergency occurs, then you say, well, I, you know, it's not going to work. I can't do it. And you just, and you use it as an excuse to not stay motivated and not do it, right? And not stay disciplined. So make sure you've got an emergency reserve. Make sure you've got a cash available, you know, that you can get to just in case something comes up so that it doesn't derail your whole plan. Um, you know, it's amazing how many times I'm speaking with somebody about their finances and, you know, a car engine blows out or a health issue comes up and we're talking about five, six, seven thousand dollars worth of expenses come up, a new roof has to go on. And all of a sudden their budget is completely blown up. They 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 don't have that cash. They have to go borrow that money, uh, sometimes on a credit card at a high interest rate, or from a payday loan or something like that. And all of a sudden, because the interest payments are so high on their debt, they all of a sudden can't, you know, can't uh, stay consistent with their budget. And so uh, anyway, just, just beating a dead horse here, but make sure you've got an emergency reserve uh, or some kind of cash reserve for unforeseen events. 
know that there's no perfect approach. So if you go out and you create a budget, let's say you create a manual one on a spreadsheet because of this class. And you've got a budget and you're working along and you just decide it's not really working. It's not doing what you would hoped. It's too cumbersome, it's too tedious. Then go out and upload you know, or download a, a, a mobile app or go on and get some software. Uh, you know, just go out and find one of the free apps and see if it works and try it out for a little while. And if it doesn't, go to something else. The point is, don't get stuck on something if it's not working. Uh, if you don't find yourself reviewing your budget fairly regularly, then, then it's not working. You know, find something else. Maybe it needs to be on your phone in order for that to happen. Um, but just know that there's no perfect approach. If, if, if your buddy or friend says, hey, this is what I do for budgeting, that's great. It, you know, take take their feedback and, and maybe try it out, but just know that it might not be right for you. There, there's lots of different ways to budget, and uh, I think there's some consistent themes about making budgeting successful, but I don't believe that there's one way to budget and that's it. I think there's lots of different approaches that you could have and, and be willing to change and try different things until you find what's what's good. You gotta have buy-in. Um, one of the things that, that is so important is that you've got to have motivation, right? And if you're married and, or if you're living with somebody and you have a significant other and they're not motivated but you are, that'll blow up your budget. Uh, that won't work, right? Because if you're motivated and you're trying to live frugally and they're not and they're having fun and buying lots of stuff and not worrying about what they spend, well, that's going to wear you out at some point, right? It's going to frustrate you to a point where you're either going to say one of two things. Either I can't live with this person. <laughs> and financial issues cause divorces a lot more than I think we think they do. Or the other option, and perhaps, you know, sometimes even worse, uh, you'll keep up with them. You'll say, well, if they're going to spend, I'm going to spend, right? And it, and it just creates kind of this cycle where nobody's being disciplined and both of you are spending whatever you want, being undisciplined about your money, and you're both justifying it by looking at the other one and saying, well, they're doing it right? It's kind of this weird negative peer pressure that happens to us as adults when it comes to our finances. And so I, I would just strongly encourage you, you know, one of the things that Dave Ramsey does with Financial Peace University is he doesn't allow somebody who's married to just do it on their own, right? It's not going to happen. It's not going to work. It's not going to be successful. His thing is, no, do this as a couple. Do this as a family. Make sure there's buy-in because if there's not, even if you're completely committed, somebody else can ruin this, right? Very easily. And so you want to get buy-in from all people involved in financial decision-making, which in the case of a family is everybody is part of your household, but most importantly, you know, the decision-makers, the spouses. Okay. All right. So make sure there's buy-in. Make sure it's adjustable. We've already talked about that. Make sure you look, when you look at a budget, a lot of people are forming a budget in order to find opportunities to cut expenses, right? We always talk about eating out. We always talk about the morning coffee, all these different things that take extra expense and it's legitimate. Those things take a lot of extra money out of our pocket, eating out and coffee, um, as well as, you know, 100 other things that all of us have different things that, that can be kind of money wasters, right? Um, while you should focus on those different things and try to cut out, you know, expenses that you actually can cut out, uh, one of the things that you could, you could consider, or at least think about, is, is adding to the revenue side, adding to the income side. And I know you know, this gets overstated sometimes in Utah where I live because a lot of people do multi-level marketing, you know, ventures on the side. They, they get really excited and, and proud of their side hustles that they have, you know, where they're, you know, trying to sell things on the side. There's a lot of legitimate ways to do something on the side. But, but don't take it to the point where you feel like you've got to have five different streams of income and buy into these folks who, you know, are selling you something, you know, they're selling you books, they're selling you programs, they're selling you ways to get rich quick. Obviously, I would encourage you to avoid those kinds of things. What I would encourage you to do is to consider, can I get a promotion? Can I change jobs? Can I improve my situation? Much like you are, or you wouldn't be going to school, right? We're looking at that income side, and we're saying, hey, if I get a degree, I should be able to improve that income side. Look at that throughout your life, though. Uh, you know, when you're done with your degree and have that job, look at opportunities to, for promotion, look at opportunities to, for advancement, for bonus, for, for income raises, those kinds of things. And, and a lot of times, if you're looking for it, you'll actually find some of that. If you're not looking for it, you definitely won't find it. Um, you know, or most times you won't find it, I should say. We had somebody join. Appreciate you joining. Uh, let me pull up the chat box. I'd closed it. Can you hear me okay? 
Christy, thanks for joining. So I've got the chat box open if you, if you want to write in anything, if you have questions. We're just about to wrap up, actually. We've only got about seven or eight minutes left. I think uh, with the holiday tomorrow being the first day of the mod and also with Stranger Things 2 out uh, as of, what, two days ago, three days ago, uh, I'm, I'm competing with a lot of stuff tonight. <laughs> so, hey, Christy, I'm just glad you're here. I appreciate you coming. We're talking about tips and tricks for budgeting, and we're going over some different things. We've, we've done a lot, so I'd encourage you to, you know, obviously review the, the first half of the session, first part of the session. There's a lot about the course and about information that will help you out with the course. We're just kind of getting through some of the material now here at the end. So I'll have the recorded, I'll have the recorded session posted by tonight. So it'll just be a YouTube video that you can access the link through the same link that you went on to the live sessions. There'll be links to each one of the recordings. So I'll post that I've, you know, posted the, the session and that you can review it. And then if you click on that live session link on our main course page, under week one, there'll be actually a, a hyperlink after I post it that will get you to the full video. Okay? Any questions on that, Christy? Let me know if you have a hard time getting to it, you know, after we wrap up. You can email me or text me. Uh, I'll probably have it posted within an hour. It usually takes a little bit of time to process those videos and, and to submit them. But as soon as I can, I'll, I'll have it posted for you so you can review. Okay. All right. Uh, so we're talking about different, uh, one of the readings for this week, one of the required readings talks about eight steps to, for a successful budget. We're talking about, as you came on, you know, the focus usually within budgeting is to cut as many costs as we want. We always talk about cutting, you know, coffee costs, cutting, um, going out to eat, you know, fast food, the, those kinds of things. But sometimes we don't focus enough on how to improve our income side. And a lot of times we don't have control or I, should I say a lot of control over our income side, but many times there are some different simple things that we could do to try to improve the income side of our of our ledger, okay, of our budgets. And then make sure that you're realistic. We talked about having, you know, some flexibility with our budget on the last list, the 10, you know, tricks and tips that we just really talked about on one of the other readings. But if we're not realistic with these budgets, they, they don't mean anything. They're not even worth the paper they're on. Again, I, and I've talked, you know, I've, I've tried to make this, comparison a lot tonight because I think most of us have dealt with the idea of diet and exercise, right? And goals associated with diet and exercise, at least I have. And, and you know, I'm 38 years old now and I've had multiple years where I've had these great goals as far as pretty much every year. I've had different diet and exercise goals and, uh, you know, with, with very mixed success, not, not a lot of great success. So I can kind of speak from experience here. Maybe you all have great success with it. I don't. Um, so one of the things that I, that, that, haunts me many times with my diet and exercise goals is that they're not realistic. Like, for example, I'll say, hey, no sugar, no caffeine, no soda, no uh, fat, no, you know, I'll try to have this extreme, you know, diet, you know, to, to get healthy. Uh, and then I'll, I'll say I'm going to, you know, run for an hour every morning and I'm going to do 100 push-ups and 100 sit-ups and all kinds of different things and make these great goals for myself. And then it just becomes very difficult because it wasn't realistic in the first place for me to do it. It, it might be a lot better to take, you know, what we refer to as some baby steps with, with your finances before we get to kind of the extreme. Now, some people can be very extreme, right? They don't, the moderation thing doesn't matter to them. They can be very extreme and they actually thrive in those circumstances. They can be very disciplined. And some people are that way with their finances. They, they pinch every single penny. They never spend anything needlessly. They're just very naturally disciplined when it comes to their finances. Uh, most of us are not, okay? So we need to be very realistic and take baby steps when it comes to our finances and be forgiving of ourselves and just start over, right? Try again, get up again, you know, as many times as we need to to try to make progress when it comes to, to our budget. All right, and then there's a podcast, and I know there's additional articles that, that we haven't even talked about, but there's also a podcast that, that talks about all kinds of different things when it comes to money and basic finance and budgeting principles. And I thought some of the things, you know, again, just a few of the different things that I thought to point out, I thought the spending diary was, was helpful. You know, you're going to have a budget that kind of looks forward and tries to develop what you should spend and what you have to spend and what your discretionary income is to make progress towards your goals. But a spending diary 
forces you to write down, if you're disciplined about it, forces you to write down what you're going to actually, what you actually did. And sometimes when you're documenting on a day-to-day -day basis, and I know this sounds tedious, but when you have to document it, sometimes that actually helps you to be more disciplined about what you spend on. Okay. You start to say, Oh, I didn't need to do that. I didn't even think about it. That's just my morning coffee or whatever. But man, I spent five or six bucks. I probably don't need to spend that much, you know, and I probably shouldn't spend that much. And you, you start to think through that and just having your finances top of mind with that spending diary sometimes can really help you out. Um, you have small amounts of cash on hand and you don't use anything but cash for purchases. Uh, cash only system or small amounts of cash can really help you out to be disciplined and, and it's it, a lot of times it's plastic that kind of spins us out of control because we don't think of it as money. Uh, they've done studies and people who use a cash only system for their budget will spend less and be more disciplined than folks who just use a credit card for everything. And a lot of people say, well, yeah, but I get rewards on my credit card. That's fine. If you're really disciplined, that's fine. But some people need to go to a cash only system to get their patterns right and then they can go back to credit cards and get those rewards once they've got those patterns in order okay make sure that your food expenses are you know good and and just evaluate food expenses that that tends to be a really big area of waste uh, make sure you cut or you add right we, we talked about how about how it's both try to add income try to cut costs coupon shop shop when you're full you know, don't shop when you're hungry. We've heard that a lot of times. Don't eat out as much. You know, stuff that we've all heard. Pay yourself first. That's that automate, uh, you know, principle that we talked about. Make sure you've got an emergency fund. We've talked about that over and over and over again tonight. Uh, make sure that you are looking at your utilities, your financing, your bills. Make sure that you're evaluating each one of them. It's amazing how much wiggle room a lot of those bills will have as you look into them and evaluate them and try to make sure that you're getting the best deal possible. And sometimes just a simple phone call or a letter goes so, you know, such a long way in, in trying to help your finances and get things in order. And then make sure that you're actually doing a good job with your taxes. Some of us just don't even think about taxes. It only happens once a year. We usually get a refund. We just don't worry about it. But a little bit of extra effort on credits and deductions and making sure and getting free help that's out there might go a long ways in getting you a few extra bucks back or might go a long ways in helping you to pay a little bit less, you know, each year when it comes to your, your taxes. And again, freeing up some of that expense or reducing some of that expense will help you to, to have more, right? And be able to accomplish those goals that you're laser focused on, uh, you know, for the future. So Christy, that's all I have for tonight. Sorry that we didn't get too much time with you, but I appreciate you coming in. I hope you have a great holiday tomorrow. And uh, I'll post this, you know, here within the next hour, two hours. I've got another class I've got to teach, so it might be a, an hour or two out. Um, it does take a little bit, like I say, to post them, but it'll be up tonight. Then you can review the rest of it. But have a great night. Uh, let me know if you have any questions or concerns or get stuck this week, and we will talk to you all next week. Have a great night.